Okay, my America, as far as I can see, Meg's Prairie Diary. We're reading a diary of a little girl who lived during the cholera epidemic of the 1850s. June 8, 1856. There is no church nearby, so we held our own worship this morning. We stood in a circle holding hands. Uncle Aubert said the 23rd Psalm. Then we each prayed silently. I said my usual, Dear Lord, please help Mother and Grace to get well. Press told me he loves Kansas. He loves running outside all day. He loves flying his kite in the wind. He even loves gathering buffalo chips. He wishes we never had to go home again. I said Kansas is the end of the earth. June 10, 1856. I have a little room of my own. Uncle Albert fastened an oak plank to the wall with wooden pegs. It is like a shelf, only wider. Aunt Margaret and I stuffed a mattress ticking with hay. We tied this hay mattress on top of the wide shelf. Aunt Margaret gave me a ticking stuffed with chicken feathers too. She says I can sleep on top of the feather bed in the warm weather and crawl under it when it gets cold. I reminded her that I am staying only for the summer. I will not be here when the weather turns cold. Uncle Albert hung a quilt from the rafters. That is my wall. We put my trunk beside my bed for a table. I put a candle and my diary on it. It is a cozy little room. June 11, 1856. I awoke in the night to yellow eyes staring at me. I screamed. The eyes vanished. Aunt Margaret came running. A wolf was here, I cried. Aunt Margaret reached under my bed. She picked up a gray cat. Here is your wolf, she said. The cat's name is Mouser. I stroked her, and she purred like the engine of the Kansas hopeful. Press, Charlie, and John followed me around all day today, howling like wolves. At last, George made them stop their teasing. George is serious and a good helper to his father, but Charlie and John are as wild as press. June 12, 1856. Uncle Margaret hitched Kip to the ox cart this morning. She put the wash tub in the cart and all the dirty clothes. I went with her down to the stream. We walked through the prairie grass that goes on and on as far as I can see. Mouser came too. She was hidden in the tall grass. We could see only the grass tops parting as she ran. At the stream, we took off our shoes and stockings. Then Aunt Margaret took off her skirt. I gasped. She wore only her bodice and pantalets. Aunt Margaret laughed. She said she favored the new style, started by Amelia Bloomer. Mrs. Bloomer believes that women should not have to wear heavy skirts and many petticoats. She believes women need clothes that make it easy for them to move when they have to work. So Mrs. Bloomer has invented bloomers. They look like men's wide-legged trousers, and they're gathered at the ankles. Aunt Margaret, working in her pantalets, mother would say she's a disgrace but mother is not in Kansas. I took off my skirt. Aunt Margaret and I waded into the cold, clear water. We filled up the wash tub. Aunt Margaret poured in a thick, strong-smelling soap that she had made herself. Then she put in the white clothing. She scrubbed and kneaded them in the suds. No wonder her hands are so red. I helped her wring out the soapy water from the clothes while she washed the dark clothing. I rinsed the white clothes in the stream. I waded up to my knees. How good it was to have a cool job on such a hot day. When the clothes were rinsed, we wrung them out and spread them on the grass to dry. While the clothes dried, Aunt Margaret and I lay on our backs and watched the clouds. They were white and fleecy, like lambs blowing across the sky. Far away, we saw a dark cloud. In no time, the wind blew it over our heads. With a clap of thunder, that cloud let loose a flood of rain. Aunt Margaret and I ran around picking up the clothes from the grass, but we couldn't run fast enough. When the storm was over, all the clothes were streaked with mud. 
We had to start wash day all over again. Mouser appeared after the storm. There was not a drop of water on her. June 13, 1856. Aunt Margaret was stirring up corn cakes for lunch. She asked me to season the batter. I put in a pinch of salt. Then I reached for a shaker labeled pepper. Aunt Margaret quickly took the shaker from my hand. She unscrewed the lid. She showed me that this pepper is bright red. This is Aunt Margaret's just-in-case pepper. Just in case a border ruffian or an unfriendly Indian or a bear ever comes into the cabin, she will give him a face full of fiery red hot pepper. Later, something terrible has happened. We saw what looked like a rain cloud coming, but it was a cloud of grasshoppers. They settled in Uncle Albert's cornfield. In no time, they stripped the leaves off of every plant. The whole crop is ruined. Uncle Albert has gone off on a walk by himself. George tried to run after him, but Aunt Margaret held him back. She said that Uncle Albert needs time alone before he will be fit company. June 15, 1856. I have a friend. Her name is Lily Van Beek. She is 11, but she is small for her age, so we are the same size. Lily has brown braids and freckled cheeks. I didn't realize how lonely I have been for a friend. Lily's family lives on the claim nearest this one. It is one mile away. Last night, the Van Beeks came for a potluck supper. Aunt Margaret says whatever we are, whatever we are lucky enough to have, we throw into the pot. The Van Beeks brought potatoes and pork for the pot and fried apples for dessert. They moved to Kansas from Minnesota. Lily has three older brothers and three younger brothers. She and I are both so happy to have another girl to talk to. I wore my cream silk dress to dinner. Lily said she has never had a silk dress. She has only the blue and brown checked gingham dress she had on and a green and brown checkered gingham for Sunday. I told her that I lacked prairie clothes, and Lily came up with the best plan. We ran into my little room. We slipped out of our own dresses. We put on each other's clothes. Lily's gingham dress felt so soft and comfortable. We ran out. Uncle Albert pretended he couldn't tell which of us was Lily and which was Meg. Mr. Van Beek took up his fiddle then. Aunt Margaret got out her tambourine. They played, and the rest of us danced. We hooked elbows with partner after partner and swung around and around. I think George liked having Lily for his partner. Press and John swung so wildly they felt sick to their stomachs and had to go outside. We danced until we collapsed onto the rug. Then Mrs. Van Beek began singing. She sang, Call to Kansas. It made me miss our little, our old bear. At last, Mrs. Van Beek said they had had best be going home. Lily and I had to trade back our dresses. By the door, the grown-ups grew serious. They whispered about someone named Dell. Mr. Van Beek said the marshal had his eye on their cabin and that he was looking for any sign of a runaway. Dell would not be safe there much longer. Mrs. Van Beek said something about the Underground Railroad in Canada. Aunt Margaret is calling me to worship. I wonder who Dell is. Later, my prayer has not changed. After worship, I took out the pictures of mother and father and Grace and Nellie. I miss them all so much. It makes my head ache. Later, Uncle Albert is worried about Molly. She has lain down on the floor of the barn. She will not get up, even to graze. Charlie and John must take grass and water to her. I heard Aunt Margaret say that if they lost the cow, it would be a hard winter. June 17, 1856. Aunt Margaret is making my prairie dress. She says she will show me how to stitch hems. It is made from tan cotton cloth with small blue flowers. It is not at all fashionable, but it is just right for Kansas. June 18, 1856. 
Press called and crawled into the shelf bed with me early this morning. He shook and said he was cold, but his head was burning hot. Aunt Margaret put a wet cloth on his forehead. She told me not to worry. Her own boys had come down with the shakes before, and look at them now, she said. June 19, 1856. I sit by my brother on my bed. I sponge his hot red face and his skinny little arms. It is frightening to see him lie so still. Press is never still. How could I ever have wished that Press would come down sick? I never meant it in my heart. June 20, 1856. Press has not eaten in three days. If only Dr. Bear were here, he would know what to do. Press sleeps in my shelf bed, so Charlie and John made me a prairie feather bed on the floor of my room. Aunt Margaret tells me to get some sleep or I shall get sick too. But how can I close my eyes? I must watch over Press. June 21, 1856. Uncle Albert brought home a letter from Father, but it was the letter he wrote a month ago before Press and I left St. Louis. Uncle Albert says, the fighting around Lawrence makes the mail service unpredictable. Later, Preston thrashes around so. The bed ticking is soaking wet. He says crazy things about riverboat gamblers. Aunt Margaret says it is the fever talking. Later, Preston's fever has broken. This afternoon he sat up in bed. He hollered, four feet, five feet, no bottom. And he sank back down. I feared that the fever had made him lose his mind. Then I felt his head. It was cool. Aunt Margaret says Press will soon start to feel better. June 22, 1856. Preston is pale and thin, but he is kicking off the covers. He badly wants to get out of bed. Aunt Margaret says I mustn't let him. I am so thankful he's better. More good news. Molly has given birth to twins. Both calves are healthy and drinking Molly's milk. We worshipped longer than usual today. We had much to be thankful for. June 25, 1856. Late last night, there was a knock on the door. It was Theo Van Beek, Lily's oldest brother. Theo said now the marshal has a posse with him. The men ride by their cabin. They speak loudly so the Van Beeks can hear them. They talk about a man who wants his property back. Theo said he made sure he was not seen coming to our cabin. He asked if Del might stay with us until the Underground Railroad comes for her. Aunt Margaret and Uncle Albert both said yes. Theo asked if they knew the punishment for hiding a runaway slave. Uncle Albert nodded. If caught, he would have to pay $1,000 and spend six months in prison. One thousand dollars! Uncle Albert, Albert does not have much money. And what if he went to prison? What would become of his family? But Aunt Margaret said, it's the right thing to do. Uncle Albert said, the only thing. Theo said his family would come over tonight for supper and that Dell would be with them. Then he slipped out of our cabin and disappeared into the night. My heart beats like a drum. A runaway slave coming here to this tiny cabin? Wherever can we hide her? Later. No one says much now. Everyone walks around the cabin. We all hope to discover some small hiding space we never noticed before. Press is so pale. His poor arms are as skinny as twigs, but he is wild again. Aunt Margaret says he may not get out of bed, so he stands on his head in bed. He puts his feet against the wall. He stays there until his face turns purple. We all scold him, but he cannot hold still. 
we have a bigger worry. Dell is coming tonight, and there is still no place to hide her. Later, Press has given us an idea. I came into my room with soup for him, but he was not in bed. When I called his name, there was no answer. Suddenly, Press sprang out from under the feather bed, shouting, No bottom! I was so startled, I nearly spilled the soup. Then I thought, if Press can disappear under the feather bed. Later, the Van Beeks came for supper in the pouring rain. There are so many of them. They knew the marshal would not notice one extra passenger in the wagon. They were all bundled up against the rain. The whole family came into our cabin together in a bunch. Then they stepped apart, and there was Dell. She wore a man's hat. A scarf was round around her throat and covered half of her face. She had on a long-sleeved man's shirt, gloves, trousers, and boots. She took off her hat and unwound her scarf. I saw that she was not very big and that she had a deep scar on her forehead. Quickly, Aunt Margaret took Dell into my little room. She explained the plan, how if the marshal came, Dell could hide between the straw mattress and the feather bed, how Press would play sick, how he would lie on top of the feather bed covered in quilts. Dell nodded. She smiled at Press. She said she hoped he would not mind a lump in his bed. Press bounced on the bed. He said he liked lumps. I scolded Press for bouncing. I said that this was not a game. This was the most important thing he would ever do, that if the marshal came, he must pretend to be asleep and not move a single muscle. Press said he understood, but he bounced as he said it. Then Dell sat down on my trunk. She said if the marshal came, she knew Press would do just fine. Press nodded, but he kept on bouncing. We had our potluck supper. Dell said she wanted to stay in my room and keep Press company. So Lily and I took a plate to her. Then the rest of us ate and sang and danced. If the marshal and his posse looked in through the windows, they would have seen only two families having fun. One by one, the Van Beeks slipped into my room to say goodbye to Dell. Lily cried when she hugged her. Then the Van Beeks left our cabin, all in a bunch again. Now the house is quiet. The dishes are done. I have split my prairie feather bed in two. I am sleeping on one half. Dell is next to me on the other. Uncle Albert says he and George will take turns keeping watch through the night. I am about to blow out my candle. What will this night bring?